This episode of Bulletproof Cashflow is brought to you by Realty Dynamics. Learn how people like you can build substantial passive income while creating wealth for the long term through real estate investing. Visit rdyne.com. That's r d y n e.com. In the real estate business, you know, you you uh, you want to do analysis. You want to analyze the data. But that, and that's a strength because there's a lot of guys who go, oh, what the heck? Sure, here's the money. You know, and they just kind of throw it around. They don't do their due diligence or analysis and they get caught sometimes. They make bad decisions. And, and so that's their detriment. Uh, but for one who's an analytic person, you can become so analytic that you end up not pulling the trigger on, on a, a house or an apartment complex or commercial building you should buy. And then the guy who's just got the money walks in and buys it out from underneath you and you miss out because your strength carried to its extreme became your actual weakness. Working because you want to, not because you have to is financial freedom and we want to help you create that welcome to the bulletproof cash flow show we're going to teach you how to achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment your host is a multifamily syndicator and property developer he's done deals reaching into the hundreds of millions of dollars you'll hear from experts in all aspects of real estate investment finance finance development and management Everything you need is right here. This is the Bulletproof Cash Flow Show. And this is your host, Augustino Pintus. Hey, everyone, it's Augustino. As I said in previous shows, you really want the trust, respect, and admiration from your support network to help build your real estate business. Now, it requires a great deal of discipline, and that means putting discipline around your mind as well as your body and who you let in around you, right? These things are all very, very important to building the discipline you need. And many people underestimate this, uh, this part of, of, their, their human growth, right? But it's a big part of building success in their life. Now, our next guest knows all about this. After being a troubled kid with, you know, due to loss of his father, he's had to overcome various obstacles to be, and he's eventually now become a speaker, an author, a coach, uh, a leader of many people who have accomplished their goals. Now, today he is an internationally renowned speaker with clients like GE, Cisco Systems, Microsoft, the Harvard Business School, and the list goes on. Now, he's been a professional and personal development coach since 1988. In 1990, he started a small publishing company that eventually exploded into the creation of tens of thousands of personal development programs that he sold through large retailers like Costco, Walmart, and Target. Now, additionally, he is the author of 20 best-selling books with 3 million prints and copy in 13 languages and over 450 articles on success, leadership, sales, and motivation. Now, with all that, I'd like to welcome my new friend, Chris Widener, to the show. Chris, buddy, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You bet, you bet. Now, guys, if you have Chris has to say, you can reach him via the contact page at chriswidener.com. I'll, I'll uh, leave a link in the description. Okay, Chris, go ahead and tell the listeners a little bit about your journey. How'd you get started? Well, so it's a long uh, trajectory to where I am today. My dad died when I was four, and my he was making $90,000 a year in 1969. And in 1970, he died, but he only had $30,000 worth of life insurance. So rule number one, get life insurance to protect your assets for your family in case you in case you pass unexpectedly uh i tell you i could i've always said i could make a fortune selling life insurance just with my story uh we were living in a beautiful home in sandpoint country club in seattle uh which recently sold for over three million dollars and my mom had to sell the house because she couldn't afford four hundred dollars a month for the mortgage payment and you know a one hour meeting with a life insurance salesman would have completely changed the trajectory of my life now in spite of that, things, you know, have still turned out all right. God always works things out all right. And, uh, but it did begin a downward decline for us. I ended up living in 28 homes. I went to 11 different schools. I was shipped off to live with relatives twice, once in the fourth grade, once in the ninth grade. But my mom actually got into real estate and uh, she started working for a real estate company called McPherson's Real Estate in Seattle. And she was selling real estate. But in order to make money on the side, she flipped houses. 
houses. Long before, uh, long before they were popular to do on television, my mom would buy a house. She, you know, before it came on the market, somebody would come in and say, hey, I want to list my house. And she'd say, well, what would you take for it? And she'd buy it and we'd move into it. Now, I don't know why my mom couldn't flip houses in the same school district, which would have allowed me to not bounce around so much. But uh, we ended up moving around a lot. So I learned uh, quite a bit about real estate as a young man. In fact, my mom used to pull me out of school for all sorts of things. She'd take me to Disney World or Disneyland, or but she would take me to nothing down real estate seminars, which is kind of hilarious to take a 10-year-old to. And, um, and I always used to say, Mom, shouldn't I be in school? And my mom used to quote Mark Twain all the time. She'd say, son, you can't let school get in the way of your education. So she, I grew up in a real estate home. Uh, you know, my mom was a realtor, uh, eked my way out of high school. I was a troubled kid, barely got out of high school, uh, barely got into college, ended up getting a, a degree in youth and family. And I moved to Northern New Jersey into a little tiny town uh, called Mendham, New Jersey, very, very wealthy town. And I sat on the board of a nonprofit there with a bunch of very wildly successful people. Um, one of my first business mentors was the CEO of Mars Candies. Uh, I met him when his, he was the senior vice president. And he eventually ascended, as he would say, to the highest office you can have at Mars without being a member of the Mars family. And uh, But the number two guy at Prudential, a former NFL quarterback, and uh, the number five guy at Exxon, you know, all these guys kind of took me under their wing because I was the youth representative on the board of this nonprofit. So here I was 22 hanging around with all these really successful people. So I got mentored pretty early on and uh, eventually started a company called uh, Made for Success. And as you mentioned, we started selling uh, oh, probably 50 to 75,000 audio programs a month through Costco and Sam's Club in the personal development space. And I was speaking and writing. And then uh, early 2000s, over the course of about seven years, I my career just went like this, you know, because I was asked to work with John Maxwell. I think John has probably 35 million copies in print of his books and then uh, worked with a guy named Jim Rohn. Many of your fan, uh, fans may know Jim Rohn. Gave Tony Robbins his first job, one of the great real legends in the personal development industry. And then I had a television show in Dallas and and the network decided uh, they wanted to have Zig Ziglar do a television show as well. And Zig was getting on in age and and I knew him and his son because of our audio program business and, and they asked me if I would co-host the show with Zig Ziglar. So over the course of about uh, seven years, I got to work with John Maxwell, Jim Rohn, and Zig Ziglar. People say, you know, tell us the secret to building a wildly successful speaking career. And I say, it's just a three-step process. First, have John Maxwell call you. Second, have Jim Rohn call you. And third, have Zig Ziglar call you. And then it's just easy from there. So, you know, once you do those three things, it's pretty easy. So I got very fortunate. I've traveled all over the world, 2,500 speeches uh, all over the world, Russia, China, Singapore, uh, Australia, Germany, Spain, um, uh, Cairo, Egypt. I've actually spoken in Cairo, Egypt twice. Um, but uh, it's been a great ride. It's a lot of fun. I get to go to a lot of cool places, meet a lot of cool people. And, uh, and I, I've, I've, I've enjoyed it. Life is, life is good. Nice, nice. Now, how do you coach others to become truly successful, both internally and externally? Like, how do you do that? Well, I use a different process. You know, a lot of people, you know, you say, well, I'm going to hire you. And, and then they send them a three ring binder and they say, okay, call one is session one and everything's cookie cutter. So what I decided early on, I hired a coach in like the mid nineties and I felt like every time I called him, he had to kind of look at his thing and pull the binder off and go, oh, okay, Chris Widener. And I always just remember feeling like it was just, the process was just mechanical or cookie cutter. And I, I remember saying to myself, if I ever do a coaching program, I'm going to keep it to very few people. So I know them, I know their families, I know their wife's name. I know the, you know, I want to know them. I want to know their story of origin. I want to know all those kinds of things. So I never take more than 10 clients at a time. And it is very intuitive. And it is business and life coaching. What happens typically is people hire me for business coaching, and they realize that they really need a lot of help in their life coaching. Because uh, most people figure, well, those two things are separate. They're not. They're completely, completely tied together. If you have a fight with your spouse in the morning, it affects how the rest of your day goes. You're not going to be as efficient. You're not going to be as mentally crisp. You know, those kinds of things. 
or your your uh, history growing up. I had a woman hire me once. Uh, she was the president of a company. They had, uh, I think, uh, I think about a hundred employees. It was a um, uh, like a supplement company. They all hundred employees were under one roof, and the company was privately owned by a seventy five year old man, and she was fifty. And on the second call, she said to me, and she was making $500,000 a year. So good income, you know, professional woman. And before they start, they fill out what I call personal confidential profile. And it tells me literally everything about their life except their, except their sex life. I don't care who they have sex with. But I want to know their story of origin, their family, their current relationship with their family, where they were in their birth order, where they went to school, the highs, the lows, their finances, their family, like everything. Uh, I want to know everything about them because who you are determines what you're doing today. And so she filled this out and then jumped forward to about our second or third call. She says, can I talk to you about something else today? I said, yeah, sure. What do you want to talk about? She said, well, I just had this interaction with my boss and he got really mad at me. And I got to tell you, every time he gets mad at me, I run to my office and I lock the door and I don't answer his emails and I don't answer his phone calls. She said, why do I do that? I'm a 50 year old woman making a half a million dollars a year, running a big company with a hundred employees. Why do I do that? And I said, did you read your confidential personal profile? She said, read it. I wrote it. And I said, so you don't remember how when you were a little girl and your dad was a yeller and he'd start yelling and you ran to your bedroom and hid under the bed? There went the light bulb. She had not made the connection between these two things. She even wrote to me what it was. And then she told me about another problem and never realized that she was. And so I actually, I worked with her a little bit, but what I really had her do was I, I told her, you need to go to a counselor and deal with the emotional trauma from your childhood. And so she did. So I got her into a, a you know, in with a counselor who could help her with that side of things. But um, I really try, it's, it's much more of a whole life wholeness oriented because, uh, you know, we are body, soul, and spirit. And so there is that spiritual side of us, that part that lives eternally that, you know, and then we have the mind, will, emotions, they exist, but you can't touch them. You can't pour them back and forth in a beaker. And then we have our physical world, you know, our bodies, our, our money, you know, anything tangible assets, those kinds of things. And, and most people think that they're separate and they're not, they're intricately connected. And so, um, Mine is more of a whole life kind of coaching, and it's much more intuitive. Uh, we go where the water flows, so to speak, and uh, been wildly successful with that. I've got some great reviews. Uh, people make more money. They have better relationships, and and it's a lot of fun to be able to work with, with people like that. Hey, Augustino here, and I would love to connect directly with you. Text the word BOOKS to 844-428-428. 1344 to receive weekly book recommendations from me. Do you think that it's one of those subtle things like what you just described here? I mean, it's not so subtle because it was, I mean, you're able to pull that out, but do you think it's those subtle things that, that often not only prevent people from becoming successful, but also on the flip side, it's also helps them become su successful, meaning that they, they are successful because of something that happened. It was, a, it was a positive thing as opposed to a negative thing of what you just described. Because to me, it sounds, it sounds very similar to some of the things I, I've expo I was exposed to when I was a kid that really impacted me into adulthood. I had no idea. It took me, a, what, until my 50s to figure something out, for instance, right? Yeah. Uh, would you say that's, uh, that's the case? Yeah, I think that uh, I've, I've often said that your greatest strength carried to its extreme is your greatest weakness. And, and so, for example, my greatest strength is the ability to talk. I've made a living my entire career talking. I, in high school, you know, as a little kid, my mom bought me Mr. Microphone. I don't know if you remember Mr. Microphone. It's a microphone with a battery in it, and it ties into your, your radio, and you tune it to a certain thing. And my mother would come home at, from work, you know, after showing houses all evening, and I'd be waiting for her, and I'd say, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here she is, home for the evening, Charlotte Widener. And she's just like, oh, my God, who is this kid? 
kid. And, um, you know, in high school, I did morning announcements at my high school. You know, you sit down in homeroom and the buzzer goes off and it's like, I'll play, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And, you know, we've got uh, fish sticks and tater tots for lunch today. And the bus to the junior varsity basketball game leaves at three. Please be out behind the gym and don't be late. That was me. College basketball. I was the in-house announcer for college basketball. And, you know, so I've always done that. But I will tell you that my mouth has taken me all over the world. Being able to speak has taken me all over the world. It's gotten me, made me millions of dollars. It's been a great blessing. But most of the trouble I've ever gotten to in life has been because of this mouth, right? So your greatest strength carried to its extreme becomes your greatest uh, weakness. And I'll give you another example, analysis. In the real estate business, you know, you, you, uh, you want to do analysis. You want to analyze the data. But... That, and that's a strength because there's a lot of guys that go, oh, what the heck? Sure, here's the money. You know, and they just kind of throw it around. They don't do their due diligence or analysis and they get caught sometimes. They make bad decisions. And, and so that's their detriment. Uh, but for one who's an analytic person, you can become so analytic that you end up not pulling the trigger on, on a, a house or an apartment complex or commercial building you should buy. And then the guy who's just got the money walks in and buys it out from underneath you and you miss out because your strength carried to its extreme became your actual weakness. So whatever your strength is, take a look at that and say, how can I operate out of that? Um, but I'll, I'll give you an example for my own life. Uh, I make really qu quick friends. I'm, I build rapport very quickly. And a lot of it has because I went to so many different schools. My mom packed me up. And next thing you know, we're in a different school. I went to a, a, a preschool, one preschool, a different kindergarten, first and second grade in one school, uh, third and half of fourth grade in one school, half of fourth grade and fifth grade in one school, different school in sixth grade, different school in seventh grade, different school in eighth grade, different school in ninth. So I had to learn how to do that. The other, the, but the downside to that, I know as an adult is that I detach really quickly as well. And so um, I think that that can be a detriment is that I, I detach too quickly from people because I, I learned the positive side of all that moving around was how to quickly develop relationships. The downside, I think, as a child was to protect myself by detaching. Um, and so, uh, again, just we have to understand our lives, uh, both, you know, past and present and how they affect our businesses, our decision making, uh, all of those kinds of things, our mindset. Uh, all those kinds of things. You know, it's interesting that you've, you've identified that, that issue on a personal side with, with the detachment. How do you fix that? Like, or do you, do you work on it? I mean, I know you see that it's a problem. Do you address it or do you just, are you just aware of it and just let it go? No, no, no. Uh, you work at it. You have to, you, you know, there are times to detach, actually. Um, but you just don't want to detach from people who it would be better to work things through. So what you really have to do is you have to ask yourself, okay, is this just me? You know, am I, am I upset and I just want to move on? Or should I stick to it? Should I work this through? You know, those kinds of things. There's plenty of people in my life I'm glad I detached from. And you find out later that, you know, that you're glad that you should have detached from them and you did. But I think it's, uh, you have to understand, uh, yourself. And then you have to take a look at each individual situation and say, am I making a decision that's the right decision or am I making a reactive decision based on, you know, whatever, past hurts or past experiences or whatever. You know, you find a lot of people that go from marriage to marriage to marriage to marriage to marriage. And, you know, probably one of those marriages all along the way could have been fixed. Uh, in fact, I had a guy who I worked with, a very wealthy man who hired me to be on his board of his company. And shortly after I got there, his fourth wife left him. And it was sad. And I was like, oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry. Well, then as I worked longer, I found out that he was the CEO. His president left right after I got there as well. And then I started asking around, poking around. I realized that every top salesperson left and the average tenure of the presidents who worked for him in his business was 18 months and they all left him. So he paid me to give him good advice. So I pulled him aside one day and I said, Hey, you know, here's the deal. Here's what I've realized is you're the, you're the common denominator. You're the one who's at the scene of every accident and you, you can't keep employees and you can't keep salespeople and you can't keep leaders. And frankly, and I don't mean to be mean, but you can't keep your wives either. And he got really angry at me. And I, 
I said to him, I called him by his name, and I said, look, four wives can't be wrong. One wife could be wrong, makes a bad decision. She decides to run off the pool boy, whatever. Two wives, you kind of go, oh, that's too bad. Three wives, you go, hey, there's something there. Four wives, four wives can't be wrong. I've decided I'm going to write a book someday called Four Wives Can't Be Wrong. And it's going to be about uh, self-awareness. The guy <laughs> had no self-awareness that he was driving everybody away. And I think now, I, last time I heard, he's on like his sixth wife or something like that. And, um, and he eventually ran me out of the company. Um, so, you know, it's uh, something you have to be aware of and something you have to purposely make a decision to own your stuff and make sure that it doesn't happen again. You know, I'll give you an example from marriage uh, as well. My own marriage, I, I went through a divorce. And when I met my, my wife, Denise, who I'm married to now, uh, she had also been divorced. And we decided we wanted this marriage to last a lifetime. So we did a ton of self-analysis. And what I figured was, if my first wife didn't like it, my second wife probably wouldn't like it either. So I better figure out what those things were. So I actually texted my ex-wife and I said, I'm doing a lot of personal, you know, personal growth and personal development. Even though I'm a world leader in personal development, personal growth, you have to look at yourself. All of us have to be doing it. And I said, would you be willing to tell me what two or three things I did that contributed most to the demise of our marriage? And she sent me three things. She texted me three things. Well, this, this, and this. And I wrote back and I said, okay, thank you. I really appreciate that. Upon which she sent me three more things. <laughs> and uh, and so, but I, took, but I took those seriously. I really took them seriously. And then at that point, she said, I don't want to help you anymore. I said, okay, no problem. I don't need any more to work on. But both Denise and I looked at ourselves and we would read books together. And, uh, and, and she would say, I, I didn't do this. Like we would read and it would talk about how to have a good marriage or whatever. And she'd say, I didn't do this in my first marriage. And I would say, yeah, I didn't do that in my first marriage either. So all, we're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to have failures. The difference between successful and unsuccessful is who learns from those mistakes and those failures and who continues to perpetrate them over and over and over again. Do you think it has something to do with uh, also getting older, you know, becoming a little more wiser? Uh, like the, I think there's some inherent traits in that as well. Sure. Yeah. You, you become wiser, you know, time gets shorter and shorter and, and you want to make sure that your life is, is, uh, good toward the end. I mean, sometimes you read these stories, um, oh, who's the guy that owns Viacom, uh, Summer Redstone, Summer Redstone, you know, you read about his life. The guy's like 90 years old. In fact, he might've died. I can't remember, but my gosh, the war that went on between him and his ex-wives and his maid and his children and everybody wanted, who wants to live the final? years of their life in a big giant mess like that you know so as you get older you want more peace in your life and so you learn to you know there's there's hills to die on and there's hills to just not die on anymore and i think uh you know wisdom is wasted on the young and uh it's benefited by the the older yes yes now what do you consider to be wrong ideas just just plain old wrong uh that other people describe or attribute to their success I, I think there's a lot of debate about this, um, how quickly you can have success. So, you know, Tony Robbins is great, love him to death, but his whole thing is massive action, right? Massive action. And, um, and I am very much an action oriented person, but to me, the massive action sounds a lot. It reminds me a lot of the old Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare. And there's a lot of people who just throw themselves into it. And oftentimes, in fact, I would say most of the time, you don't get the results you're looking at from massive action. And so you, you blow everything. And then all of a sudden you go, oh, man, that didn't work out the way I wanted it to. Uh, I'm going to quit. I'm out of here. You know, uh, I am much more of the opinion, although we need to take action. I'm very action oriented. I am much more the slow plotter step by step by step by step. And uh, when it comes to the finish line, I'm going to win because I'm going to outwork you out, you know, plodding along every single day, brick upon brick, you know, those kinds of things. And I, I think that that's one of the, the things that I see the most is 
you know, they want to replace discipline with massive action. And I think that discipline is the key to all success. You, if you're disciplined, you will far, far out, uh, um, you know, far succeed other people um, who might take massive action and then they just don't succeed They want to, the way they want to succeed. Interesting. Now, do you think there's certain steps or some sort of process that anybody can follow to help build some of that discipline? Because I'm a big believer in discipline, doing, doing the hard work of going to the gym every day. Uh, that takes discipline. You know, it's hard. It's tough if you're putting, if you're putting yourself through a very rigorous uh, training regime. Reading every day. For some people, it's just hard to do. They don't want to set aside the time. But this is all part of building that discipline. Do you have a process or anything else like that you could recommend to folks out there? There is no process. You either do it or you don't. Uh, a friend of mine posted the other day, I'm writing a book on accountability. Uh, what, what's your key thought on accountability? And I wrote and said, there is none. There, there is no such thing as accountability. You, you cannot hold me accountable. You can ask me questions. Hey, did you ride the bike today? Did you read your book today? Did you... You asking me has no bearing on whether or not I decide to do it or not. I am the only person who will decide whether I do anything. There is no such thing. There is only self accountability. And there is no, nobody can hold you accountable. You can say, Oh, I've got an accountability partner. And they call you up. Did you, did you go to the gym today? No, I was sick. Next day, did you go to the gym today? No, I slept in. You go to the gym today? No, I did. Fourth day, did you go to the gym today? Yeah, I got up. It wasn't because he called you. It's because you finally decided to get up because you're sick and tired of being fat. It's the only reason, right? And so um, I don't think there's a process. I think you have to say, okay, what do I want to be disciplined in? It might be weight. It might be saving money. It might be reading books. It might be whatever it is, but just pick whatever it is. You want to be a millionaire? Being a millionaire, anybody can become a millionaire. It, it, you know, if you save a dollar a year, you just have to live for a million years. You'd be a millionaire, Right you know, break it down and, you know, you want to be a millionaire, save a uh, hundred thousand dollars a year for 10 years. You're a millionaire. You'll get there quicker if you invest it. Right. But it's just yeah. decide what you want, break it down into steps. And then the crux of the entire matter is, are you going to do it or not? Are you going to do it or not? And I know, I, if, if you don't, yeah, you I, won't. Yeah. I think that many people are trying to find that shortcut, right? They're trying to find that, what's that one book? What is that one the one uh, audio? What is that one interview that I need to hear to help suddenly turn the light on and become disciplined? And no, I, I absolutely agree with you. Here's um, the only audio not, you need. I never really had an accountability. I'm going to give you the only audio you need. Everybody listening, here's the only thing you need to hear. Get off your ass and do it. It's, it's the only, like, you choose to do it or you choose not to do it. Augustino telling you to do it, me telling you to do it, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is when you wake up in the morning, you now have a choice. I'm going to lay here. Am I going to go eat a blueberry muffin or am I going to go do what I want to do? Read my book, go to the gym, work on my investments, whatever. You choose. You're the only one who chooses. You know, we come into this world alone. We die alone. And, you know, you are the master of your own destiny. Nobody else is involved. You're the one who decides what you're going to do. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I, I think many people just forget or they, they associate discipline with something negative. And, and really discipline is what's going to set you free. You know, discipline of around setting a goal and doing whatever it takes to get there is, is, is super important. So it's what set me free, you know, from, from the shackles of corporate America. No, nothing against corporate America. I'm sure it's, it's fine. It's great. You know, if it's right for some people, it just wasn't for me. And uh, it was really that uh, setting a goal to getting to 200 million in a year of, uh, of acquisitions, right? That's, that's a big goal for one guy yeah. to do, right? And uh, we did it, did it last year, we're gonna do it, do it again this year, that's, that's what's happening, right? So uh, it takes a great deal of discipline to get there. But let me ask you this, uh, back, to our, back to our previous discussion. Yeah. Back, back to our previous discussion, did you buy $200 million your first year? course you didn't you probably started out with you know whatever no. a half a million dollar acquisition or something like that slow incremental growth is always the best way to go and then you get to the point where you can do 200 million a year and then pretty soon you know eventually you're buying a billion dollars and you're buying downtown skyscrapers and all sorts of things while the, everybody else was you know running around being foolish you were disciplined you know one of my favorite quotes of jim Rohn's, uh and for those of you who don't know jim Rohn, r-o-h-n jim Rohn 
Brown uh, gave Tony Robbins his first job. I was fortunate enough to spend the last seven years of his life working with him. One of his most famous quotes is, everyone must experience one of two pains, either the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. So you have to choose one of those. Do you want to experience the pain of discipline or do you want to experience the pain of regret? Because if you'll experience the pain of discipline, you won't experience the pain of regret. But if you choose not to experience the pain of discipline, you will experience the pain of regret. And uh, so everybody has to go through one of those. And it, it, you know, you might, you might not like getting off the couch and heading down to the gym or jumping on the treadmill. Might be more fun to sit there and eat a bowl of ice cream, you know, watching uh, television every night. Um, but the fact is, is the pain of discipline will keep you from the pain of regret. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. And it's a hundred percent true. It's a hundred percent true. You know, and, uh, I think we, we need, we definitely need a lot more of that these days. That's for sure. You know, I think that, uh, in order to, uh, for people to experience what they're truly capable of the true potential, it's going to take that type of, uh, of thinking to get there. Right. And, uh, it's, it's, it is easy. It is easy to sit in front of a TV, <laughs> And eat, yeah. and eat uh, ice cream all day. And see, it's and and in, in, in many ways, uh, the media pushes that on you, right? The media pushes that out there as as a way of life. And it really, I don't think that that our as a human species, we're not really geared to do that. We're not supposed to be those types of individuals. We're, not, we're just not. That's not supposed to be us. Yeah, we're I not, totally we're not agree geared for that. Totally. Uh, agree. Yeah. So what, what, what would you say is one of the biggest advantages uh, of really thinking bigger and pushing yourself like, you know, on that thought, like, what, what do you think that one of the biggest advantages uh, uh, is by, by doing it that way, by well, really and stretching I, a little bit? And I like that question because it gives me a counterpoint to the whole massive action thing. Being a disciplined thinker does not mean you're not a big thinker. In fact, somebody asked me yesterday, what's your favorite, um, what's your favorite book? Every now and again on Facebook, I'll, I'll do a top three or I'll do a, ask me my favorite. And somebody said, what's your favorite personal development book? Um, and that is, I mean, other than my own, uh, that is a uh, magic of thinking big by Dr. David Schwartz. And I tell people all the time, it's just as easy to think big as it is to think small. And, uh, and so for example, um, summer of 2003, 2004, something like that. I brought in a, a friend of mine to work at my company and I said, hey, hey why don't we go out and we will um, uh, license audio programs from other speakers and we'll put them into box sets around themes. So we did 14 CDs, one DVD. That was the, the model for our boxes. Our top three sellers were leadership, sales success, and verbal power. And so the verbal power was all about communication skills and, and vocabulary and, you know, personal charisma, all those kinds of things. And um, <clears throat> we decided we were going to try and sell them, and we did. And the very first place we called was Costco. And they said, sure, we'll take it. And we sold it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I could have gone down to Joe's five and dime and said, Hey, here's 10 boxes. Would you sell them on consignment? But we thought big. <laughs> In fact, I'll tell you a story. When I was 14 years old, my mom, um, she was doing real estate part-time when I got, uh, to 14 for a couple of years. And, uh, she was working at group health hospital and she worked with this guy and he was probably at the time 40. He seemed really old to me when I was 14, but he was like 40, uh, 45 maybe. And he, all he did all day long at the hospital was file paperwork, medical files. I mean, I cannot even imagine a job that would drive me more nuts than eight hours a day, you know, alphabetically sort filing, you know, those back offices. Well, he decided he wanted some money. So he borrowed $7,000 from his rich uncle and he bought the license for Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho for a self-watering flower pot. Now, it was a little, it was built like out of Tupperware. And so there was like a bowl, right? And that's where the water went. And then there was another bowl where the plant went and it sat down in that. And it had like a little nipple that went down from the top into the water. And then the way you drew the water up was with a little sliding dial like this. And if you have an African violet, which needs a lot of water, you put it at one end. If you had a cactus, you put it on the other end and it slowly drew water up. And it, you, you know, it lasts you a couple weeks this water. So he says to me one day, I was at the office with my, my mom or whatever, waiting to go home. And he says, Hey, how would you like to make a little money? I said, sure. 
He said, well, I've got this self-watering flower pot and I'd like you to sell for me. And I said, okay, great. And he said, I said, how much will you pay me? He said, I'll pay you a dollar per pot. I said, fantastic. Give me a, a, a pot so I can you know, show it to people. He said, okay, fine. Now, I was 14 years old and I called, um, I can't remember if it was Pay and Pack or if it was Ernst Home Centers, but it was one of those big, uh, before, this was before Lowe's, before Eagle Hardware, before uh, 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 Home Depot, any of those big box stores. And so they were all regional at that point. And so I went to, um, I called them up. I called up the buyer. I said, I'd like to come in and show you a self-watering flower pot. And they said, okay, fine. They did not know I was a 14-year-old kid. My mom bought me my first ever blue blazer. And she dropped me off on the street corner in downtown Seattle and said, I'll pick you up here in an hour. I said, okay, great. I come walking in. I said, I'm here for a meeting with so-and-so. The guy says, uh, uh, okay. I come walking in. He's like, a 14 year old kid. I mean, and you know how you are when you're 14, your blazer is way too big and whatever. And I said, this is the self watering flower pot. I took the bottom, I filled it with water. Uh, I took the top, which didn't have a plant in it because I wanted him to see the water come up, sat it down, twisted the dial and the water came up. He said, my gosh, I'll buy them. And so I said, great. How many do you want? And he said, well, I want to do a test first. I want to test them for a year. And he said, I will take four boxes for, uh, every month for uh, 20 stores. Now, there were 24 to a box. Let's call it 25 for the math, right? So 100 per store times 20 stores. So that's 2,000 per month. On my first ever sales call I ever did in my entire life at the age of 14, I sold nearly 24,000 flower pots. So... I get the purchase order. I come back to the guy. I still have not even told this guy yet. And so uh, I walk into the office with it and I go, I sold some pots. And he says, really? How many did you sell? Now, he thought I was going to take this pot and go door to door and sell them to little old ladies to put on their front porch or something like that or in their windowsill in their kitchen. And I said, whatever the math was, 23,912 <laughs> pots. And he goes, what? And And I said, yeah you know, whatever the big company was that I, I had gotten the purchase order from. Now, here's another great lesson. So first of all, think big. I could have I gone down to the local hardware guy and said, hey, do you want to buy 12 of these? But I, I thought big and I believed in it. Now, here's a really great lesson. That guy who owned that license, who hired me to go sell pots, was so terrified by the idea of success he called the company up and got his $7,000 back and quit the business. We never sold those pots. He was like, it blew his mind because if I was making a dollar a pot, I don't know what he was making. You know, maybe he was making $3 a pot. So here I just dropped 72 grand into his pocket and it was, it was all drop ship. He didn't have to receive them. He would just call them up and go, yeah, drop them to their center, you know, and then they'll distribute them. Now, why my mother didn't figure out a way to go get $7,000 and uh, and buy that license, I have no idea. But, um, you know, it's just as easy to think big as it is to think small. Yeah, it's. Uh, but I think it's exactly what it is. It's a fear of success for many people, right? It actually is a fear of success. They um, Even if you give them the answer, even if you tell them exactly what to do, I mean, you have tons of programs that if, if, if they follow it, I'm, I'm assuming you can follow this, follow this, these, these, these steps and you'll, you'll get to where you want to go, but they get, they often get in their way, their own way. I mean, I, I know it's happened for, uh, for people that I coach on, on even how to do multifamily. They just don't want to do it. <laughs> You know, and, and, and I'll uh, give you another example. Yeah, oftentimes, you, just get in their own way. Yeah, I'll give you an example from my son. Uh, he was 20 years old, and he decided he didn't want to go to college. He wanted to go into business, so he got out of college. He went into business, and his first job was selling mattresses at a company called Sleep Country Sleep Train. It started out Sleep Country in Seattle. Sleep Train bought it, and uh, he went and applied for the job. Now randomly the day that he applied for the job and they have about they had about 300 stores from from uh 
the, the Canadian border in Washington State down to San Diego, about 300 stores. So randomly, the owner of the company happened to be in town that day, and he said, hey, I want to sit in on some of your interviews. So it was the owner of the company, 300 mattress stores. It was the state or the regional guy, and then the local guy. Three of them interviewed my son. And at the very end, the owner of the company looks at my son and says, now, if you hit 50% of your goals, you'll make $50,000. If you hit 80% of your goals, you'll make $80,000. If you hit 100% of your goals, you make $100,000. If you hit 120% of your goals, you'll make $120,000. Which one of those do you see yourself as? And my son laughed at him. He literally laughed at him. And the guy goes, you think that's funny? And my son says, oh, is that a serious question? And the guy goes, yes, it's a serious question. And my son goes, oh, the 120. And then he leans forward and goes, does anybody pick anything else? And the owner laughed so hard. He He literally laughed and he says, yeah, you wouldn't believe how many people pick something else. And he goes, oh. No, for me, it's 120. And so the, they wrapped up the interview and they said to my son, they said, uh, okay, it'll be about two weeks. We'll let you know. So he jumps in his car. He's driving back up towards Seattle and the phone rings and it's the regional guy, Dan, who was the guy that owned the company. He loved your answer so much. You're hired. 10 minutes. They told him two weeks, 10 minutes into the car ride, you're hired. Uh, Within a year, he was the number one salesman in the company. Within two years, he was in the top three store managers in the company. Well, he gets home. He was living at home at the time. He gets home and he tells me, dad, why would anybody pick anything else? Why why would you pick the 50,000 when you can make 120? Why would you pick the 80,000 when you can make 100 or 120? And this goes back to sort of circling back to our original idea of understanding who you are, who you surround yourself with. You know, we were living in a big, beautiful home at the time. Uh, It was a mansion that I had driven by the first time when I was 17. It was uh, my front gate was 500 feet long, brick pillars, wrought iron fencing, big double. I called them Elvis gates that swung open like that quarter mile circular driveway, 1800 bottle wine cellar, big, spectacular mansion, half a mile of riverfront, uh, swimming pool, pool house, everything. And so my son grew up in a home like that. And that was normal for him. My friends were presidents of uh, Major League Baseball teams and a guy who ran for governor and they would come to our house. And so his entire worldview was shaped by the people he was around. He would have never said, oh, I'll make the 50 grand. So he said to me, why would people choose anything else? And I I said, because there's a lot of people who don't know anyone who makes $100,000 a year. They don't know anybody. So they're not going to say, oh, I'll make $100,000 a year because the richest guy they know is their uncle. And, you know, he makes $60,000 and shows up in a two-year-old Cadillac to the family reunion and everybody thinks that, you know, John D. Rockefeller just showed up, right? And so it's really an important lesson for under, for us to understand, one, the people that we surround ourselves with, two, what is considered normal for us, and uh, and three, are you willing to, to bite off something big and say, I'm going to go big rather than go small? And, uh, and and I think those are all really good lessons for all of us. What who do we surround ourselves with, and uh, and what is our worldview, and how did we get that worldview? You know, T. T. Harv Eckerd wrote the book The Millionaire Mind, and and how what do we think about money? There are people who are afraid of money. Yeah, that's right. There certainly are. I think it's that whole thing of um, money is the root of all evil. I mean, when I was a kid, that was one of the things that my my mother would often drill into my head, you know, and and you become afraid of it. And there's no reason to be afraid of money at all. I mean, there's <laughs> if, with with enough money, you can help a lot of people, and and we're not taught that. You know, we're not taught that. We're taught more of a scarcity mindset, unfortunately. So, and it took I know it took me a while to get out to break out of that. And money's a tool. I use an analogy. Uh, money is like a hammer. Now think about a hammer. You can take a hammer and you can build a big, beautiful home. You can build a you can build a home for habitat for humanity. Not only are you building a home, you're doing something for poor people. Such a great thing to do. Or you can smash someone's skull in with it. Something very, very evil, something very, very horrible. It's not the hammer's fault. A hammer is a tool. 
And the same thing with a dollar. A dollar can be used to buy drugs and put them into your body and hurt your body that God gave you, or it can be used to invest, or it can be used to give somebody some food, or it can be used for, for all sorts of good. So we can't look at money morally. Uh, we have to look at ourselves morally. And that's the big difference. We try to blame the money instead of looking in the mirror, holding the mirror up and looking in the mirror. That's right. That's right. I think we need more of that these days. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So so we're coming down to the end here. So if you had uh, one piece of bulletproof advice for, for someone listening, what would you offer them? Choose where you want to go and work on it every day. And I mean, it goes back to that discipline. And you know, discipline isn't sexy. You know, nobody's on Instagram going, it's going to take you 12 years to become successful. You know, you go into Instagram and it's some 30 year old or 26 year old and, and he saved up enough money, you know, drive an Uber to go rent a Ferrari for the day. And then he drives it down to the local private jet center and he parks it next to a private jet and he goes like this. You know, and then and then pretends that he's rich and then he sells a get rich quick scheme. And and because so many people are so desperate, they buy those things. You know, one of the biggest guys in the success world, well, there's, a, there's more than one, but one of the biggest guys in the success world literally got his start renting Ferraris and renting a mansion for a day to shoot video and then sold it as though it was his own until he got so rich that now he actually owns Ferraris in a mansion. But it was all a con. It was all a con. And there's a lot of those people out there. Slow and steady always wins the race. Yeah, love it. Love it. All right, guys, if you want to reach out to Chris, check out his website at chriswidener.com. Don't forget to check out his books too. He's got a wealth of knowledge that will truly help you in your own personal life and your professional life. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I'll see you next episode. Take care. You've been listening to the Bulletproof Cash Flow Show. We hope you've enjoyed the show. We know we had fun. Make sure to visit our Apple podcast page and leave us a five-star review. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. For real estate coaching, events, and resources, hit up bulletproofcashflow.com. Till next time. No information in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this show are limited to accredited or sophisticated investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure and subscription documentation and subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice.